Hello, this is Tiffany Scoggs from at the Massachusetts Office of Technical Assistance. I believe that you can hear me now. Apologies, this is our first time ever doing a webinar. Um, so um, I do outreach and policy for the Massachusetts Office of Technical Assistance, which was created by the Toxics Use Reduction Act. Uh, and we provide free and confidential technical assistance to businesses uh, in the state of Massachusetts uh, for pollution prevention, uh, and we do site visits. Today we'll be joined by uh, the director of the Taunton Emergency Management Agency, uh, Rick Ferreira. So I would like to, um, I would like to thank him. Um, just to give you a little bit of background in our office for the past three years, we have been working um, on chemical safety and climate change resiliency. So um, we have basically been, um, I can't, Go back. Um, we, we were given a grant by the US EPA to, um, to work with regional planning agencies on, um, on incorporating chemical safety and climate change resiliency. So we did 14 trainings, the first of which were, were with first responders on identifying toxics users in, uh, in their community. Uh, and then we did a second round of trainings with actually the businesses. So we recruited those first responders to um, those first responders to get businesses to participate in uh, the toxics use reduction uh, trainings. So to give you a little bit of background, um, the idea is to incorporate toxics use reduction into the climate change resiliency planning to reduce the risk of industrial accidents. So we did trainings all over the state on that. Um, so people weren't really thinking about um, the toxics use reduction uh, and how that, what that means for chemical safety until the Arkema chemical plant explosion in Hurricane Harvey in Houston, uh, Texas. So what you see in front of you are the skeletal remains of uh, refrigerated trucks that were, uh, were part of the Arkemical chemical plant. They were using organic peroxides, which need to be refrigerated, otherwise they're an explosive risk. So uh, what happened was when the floodwaters came in, the company was unable to refrigerate those chemicals, which resulted um, in them trying to move the, the chemicals to higher ground. So they put them in these refrigerated trucks and eventually the refrigerated trucks ran out of, um, out of fuel, which meant that, um, uh, th that they had to be moved to the last storage facility that had refrigeration. So in the end, workers were moving uh, these explosive chemicals by hand to higher ground until the fire department came in um, and found out that you know what was going on and required all of the workers to leave uh, saying this is an explosion risk and that um, that people should evacuate so um, what happened is that um, this was an unnecessary risk to workers but not only that they're the people who were um, were actually like trapped and sheltered in place. So uh, these are some of the messages due to social media. We can see what's going on the, on the ground. These are frightened civilians who are really stuck in the thick of things asking, you know, what these smells were in the flaring and complaining about not being able to breathe. So this is really uh, unnecessary risk to both the workers and the, um, the, the people who are sheltering in place. So in addition to that, we have the risks to uh, first responders. So, so um, you know, unfortunately, first responders were harmed. And these are the folks that, you know, we really want to protect. So all of these uh, incidents could have been avoided had our chemical plant had um, a plan or had been storing things differently. All of this happened because the electricity went out, which is something that could definitely, um, you know, people can have backup or emergency plans for emergency shutdowns, especially when they, they know that hurricane season is imminent and that there's risks coming towards them. So no one had really thought about chem, uh, chemical releases and climate change before. When you think of climate change, you might think of floods or sea level rise. And what we can see is floods don't only result in the risk of um, things being carried away or carried downstream, but emergency shutdowns can cause explosions. Then we have areas where there's extreme heat. 
Um, so again, if your HVAC system or your uh, refrigeration system can't keep up with the increase in chemical and temperature, then there's a risk of explosion. In addition, if there's a drought and your facilities result, re relies on water for the cooling or fire suppression system, that could also be a problem. In the Northeast, we have extreme cold, which can result in power outages or frozen pipes. And then storms in general can uh, result in infrastructure damage. So that includes power outage, HVAC failure. Um, but if you think about if your roof happens to have a lot of water or snow on it, that could result in uh, damage to, um, you know, to the roof um, or even roads and evacuation routes can be a problem. So we're looking at um, chemicals, you know, we're asking, is this a dangerous chemical? Is there potential for human and environmental contact? And is there potential for hazards? So with climate change, we're seeing that there is an absolute uh, potential for hazards and potential for human exposure. So we try to evaluate the risks. So we look at chemical properties. Um, you know, are these chemicals um, toxic, flammable, or combustible? Um, are there weather risks, which is something new to our office to start thinking about, meaning uh, is the facility in the flood or hurricane zone? Are there risks associated with freezing or heat or temperature? And looking at chem chemical storage, so is there secondary containment? Are chemicals stored according to compatibility rather than alphabetically, which is a huge problem? Um, and then in the end, we're always trying to identify opportunities for toxic use reduction, because if you stop it at the source, then you reduce the risks. So we do that through product substitution, reducing inventory, and engineering controls. So what we ask facilities is, are you prepared for the worst case scenario? So what our office did was we created this map that I'm about to show you. And this is a map that's available to, um, to everyone. So this is a map of Massachusetts that our office created. And what you see on the screen are tier two facilities. And tier two facilities are, are areas uh, or facilities where chemicals are used, stored, or released. And um, in 1986, we, um, the US implemented the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, which required facilities that use certain chemicals to report to uh, their local first responders to help them identify the, the risks. So the idea was to um, have this information available in order to prevent industrial accidents like what we saw in Bhopal, India and such. So what you can do is um, up here, you can type in any address in Massachusetts. So since we have Rick, we're going to put in Taunton, Massachusetts. You can put in your home address, uh, your facility address. So what you can see is we have uh, Taunton, and these are all the tier two facilities in Taunton, Massachusetts. And you can actually click on it, and it'll tell you, um, you know, what that facility is. But then you have other options on this map. So we're going to talk about, and these are the um, menu items. So you have flood threats. Um, sites with chemicals, and then you have all of these things. So we're going to look at boundaries because we try to protect um, environmental justice communities. So we're going to check off environmental justice communities. And you might ask yourself, what's an environmental justice community? If you click on the map, you can see that the environmental justice community is um, defined by income level, so low income, minority population, or English isolation. So a lot of toxic users wind up in these um, these types of areas. So we really want to protect them. So we're going to zoom in a little bit more. And we're going to add other chemical sites. So uh, these are the tier two facilities, but we're going to add major facilities. So we're going to click off this and you can see this has like a legend of the different um, type of facilities. So it starts to populate a little bit and you can actually click on this and it tells you, um, you know, what that particular facility is. Um, Toxics release inventory, um, underground storage facilities, wastewater treatment plants, um, and things start to populate. And so, what we can then do is we can look at um, flood threats. So, now we can look at actually, if we zoom in a little bit more, we can actually see worst case um, scenario. So, uh, for hurricanes. So, this is the um, hurricane zone. So, this means that these areas will flood in the event of a category three uh, hurricane or like the different colors mean different categories. 
Um, so, and you can also, again, click down here and it shows you the legends uh, for each of these. And then you can add um, flood layers. So it starts to, um, you know, it starts to get a little bit colorful. And so what we say to uh, first responders in these areas, are you communicating with the facilities that are in these, um, these risk zones? And what we say to the facilities that we work with, if you happen to be in a flood zone or a hurricane zone, are you prepared? And what can we do to help you prepare? So these are some of the, um, some of the tools that you know, we, would like to, um, we would like to share with you. So, um, so please have a look at our map, uh, use this map, and I'll go back to the presentation right now. So you can put anybody, um, any of your addresses in this particular map. Um, and this is a toxics user that our office has used, uh, has helped. So this is um, Mark Ritchie Woodworking, and they engaged in energy efficiency and toxics use reduction. And they're in an, and they're in an industrial area in Newburyport, Massachusetts. So they're really right here on the cusp of a hurricane zone. But if you can see, um, there's these little red dots. These are tier two facilities. These are other toxics users that aren't going to fare so well. Um, and flood maps are really uh, conservative, which means that uh, in the event of a hurricane, it's likely that his facility is going to be impacted too. But the good news is that he's done some work to reduce the amount of toxics on his, uh, on his property. So he worked on um, eliminating 120 gallons of lacquer thinner acetone and other chemicals per year, eliminating 1,200 gallons of denatured alcohol per year, and eliminating 12 tons of VOCs per year, saving $16,000, um, which is great. So that's less things that are likely to float off his facility. But in addition to that, he's almost off the grid. So that means that when the lights go out for the other facilities, he's less at risk for emergency shutdowns and might be able to um, contain things and, and keep running a little bit longer. So he has um, a wind turbine, solar array, and he uses all of the um, scraps from the, the wood in order to provide heat and hot water um, to his facility. So, uh, so that is great. So, as I mentioned before, we had an EPA, we did 14 trainings across the state, and we were able to train a total of 428 people. Um, so, we did our first round of trainings were for municipal trainings. Um, so, that means that there were 192 people who uh, attended those trainings. And then we had uh, 236 folks come to the, the business training. So all of those first responders and municipal uh, folks like boards of health went out and recruited the other businesses to attend. Uh, and our office was to be able to, to do um, 54 um, site visits related to this grant. So, um, so we also were able to have uh, four Worcester Polytech or WPI students work with us um, over four weeks, um, actually over seven weeks. And we asked them to evaluate, help us evaluate our training program to find out what we did well and what we needed to do improvements on. What we found, and they interviewed anyone that they could talk to, which was pretty wonderful. Um, so we found that there was a desire for hands-on or mock incidents. Um, they found, everyone found our chemical map useful. Uh, people wanted more online tools. Um, people used the trainings as a networking opportunity between companies and first responders. So people who may not have been able to meet face be to face before were able to do that. Um, people also wanted webinars. So there are people in really hard to reach or like it takes them hours to get into Boston or to another another facility. So this is the first of uh, many webinars that we hope to have um, and that people wanted to focus on severe regional weather such as like preparing for winter weatherization or hurricanes and then more specificity in trainings. In other words like more uh, trainings on type of chemicals. So maybe like preparing for ammonia, um, you know, uh, an ammonia leak drill or something or a particular type of facility. 
Um, and then the participants generally liked our training. So people said, oh, it's a no brainer to use OTA services. As I mentioned, we provide free and confidential technical assistance to the businesses, go in there and uh, you know, provide a second set of eyes. Uh, people thought we were a good resource. Um, people made contacts and, and got more resources just because they came to our trainings and met people that could help them. And then one facility said that we were able to save them like between $8,000 and $12,000 worth of free industrial consulting uh, through the work that they, or the contacts that they got uh, through OTA uh, and other state agencies. So that was beneficial. But it's not just Massachusetts that we have people uh, working on uh, doing mapping. So Resilient Nashua, New Hampshire has their own map where they can actually have um, people who live in the city of Nashua can go in and put down sites that they have um, you know, concerns with. So here's you know, somebody who has identified a tannery that might be at risk of uh, carrying chemicals off of their property um, in the event of a storm. And they also have lots of other tools that you know, we hope to borrow and maybe adapt to Massachusetts. So the Resilient Nashua Toolkit has emergency planning for all different types of facility. Um, and so that's something that we, you know, we want to replicate here and we hope that our map and our tools are also replicable in other areas. Um, you know, but we want to help people unite chemical safety and uh, emergency preparedness. So how you can do that in Massachusetts is by taking advantage of OTA site visits. So for free, we come to your facility, we look around and see what's going on and provide uh, recommendations on how to um, make improvements or toxics use reduction or pollution prevention. Uh, we also have our map and we have other resources that we can help people with. Um, then we also have grants that we can help people, um, you know, find out more about. So you'll hear in a couple minutes about the Toxic Use Reduction Institute grants, the deadline's coming up on uh, June 21st. But in addition to TURI, the Department of Industrial Accidents came to almost every single one of our trainings and they have workplace safety grants every year. And they were able to give out about $20,000 of safety grants to the people who participated in our training. So those were uh, municipalities, but also uh, companies that participated in our trainings. And then in Massachusetts, we have the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program, which provides funding to individual communities on identifying, you know, um, climate change related uh, things that they want to do in order to prepare. Uh, and that's something that, that is great uh, that's offered by the state. And uh, companies in Massachusetts that are toxic use reduction, uh, you know, covered under the Toxic Use Reduction Act have to do plans every two years on toxic use reduction. So looking at toxic use reduction through the lens of climate change uh, may provide some opportunities, you know, when you thought that you've run out of ideas, well, maybe this is another way to, to think about that. And then engaging locally, it's really important to engage with your local and regional emergency planning committees. Since we've done these trainings, OTA has been able to go out and do trainings uh, for LEPCs and REPCs all over the state. And we can also help recruit those businesses to try to um, get them to the table to talk to facilities. So with that, we're about to do um, a, a quiz. And this is for, this quiz is, quiz is specifically for toxic use reduction planners who are licensed in the state of Massachusetts and you get one CE credit. So we're going to take one minute um, and ask you to please answer these questions. All right, so, um, so we mentioned that the Toxic Use Reduction Institute has uh, grants program. So we have industry grants that are available through the Toxic Use Reduction Institute and preferences are given to uh, facilities that are using chemicals that are reported under the TURA program. So there's up to $30,000 available for um, industries. And then we also have our community grants program um, so we also have our community grants program that um, are avail available to um, community and regional or statewide organizations, municipal and municipal departments. So if you're working on a regional or statewide project, you're eligible for $20,000 um, and there's a maximum for local projects for $10,000. So if you are, want to recruit tier two facilities, 
uh, to, you know, work with them on toxic use reduction and, um, you know, with the scope of climate change, that's something that is available uh, to you. So please consider that. Um, so again, up to $30,000 available per project. You can apply online. It's a very uh, easy process and proposals are due on June 21st. Uh, evaluations um, happen during midsummer and the projects themselves run from August 2009 to June 2020. So with that, um, oh, and this is um, who you contact for, uh, for information on those grants. But with that, I'd like to turn it over to Rick Ferreira, uh, who is the, uh, the director of the Taunton Emergency Management Agency. We've had the pleasure of working with Rick on, uh, we've done a few presentations together. This is our first webinar together and um, we will take it away, Rick. So, so once again, my kudos to uh, uh, Tiffany and uh, Maya working with them today. We've done other presentations and I'll tell you in a minute why really uh, I'm, I'm passionate about being part of their program. But uh, being a part of today's webinar is a direct result of a fortuitous partnership that's developed between me and Tiffany in the Office of Technical Assistance. And as I view it, it's a partnership that's added much depth uh, to the agency's emergency preparedness and planning, uh, especially when it comes to chemicals and their impact on a, uh, a, a community during a ma major weather event. We always, a lot of times talking with companies, they look at some catastrophic failure that takes place on their facility, power outages and that type of thing, or some mixture, someone mixes something, uh, uh, you know, incompatible. But weather has become a very, very important issue when it relates to chemicals. We saw that uh, in, in Tiffany's presentation down in Houston uh, just recently on April 14th in our industrial park, we had a call that came into Taunton Fire and Police for a chemical explosion and there was a potential release. Uh, that didn't turn out to be the exact case. There were three individuals that were injured, uh, but that came in uh, you know, as an explosion and obviously the chemicals uh, that could have been released, the community involvement, Tiffany showed her, uh, her Facebook or Twitter account and all the people that have concerns. That's where this whole concept of relationship uh, comes into play. And while my, te my topic is not technical, uh, I certainly feel and I think that's why I've been part of this particular program and making these presentations with Tiffany is that it's a critical part of the chemical planning and preparedness for your community. And we as emergency management directors, uh, you know, that's a critical piece. We're always looking at the weather and, and what, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, what type of flooding is going to uh, take place, uh, what's going to be inundated, you know, you, the inundation maps that uh, are, are actually prepared by the by FEMA and the state. But they really, they, they make sense, but it really doesn't really help in the community because you have to have these relationships with folks. And the key piece is not just having an emergency plan, <clears throat> and I'm not, uh, my screen, I'm going to click on this again. Hopefully my screen will turn. <clears throat> okay, I think we've got that. Uh, that's much better. Anyway, uh, so we're creating and building community partnerships, uh, creating a solid communication path between emergency planning, you know, what's uh, your community doing and how the community uh, can help the organization and how we can help the, the community. But uh, once again, I just want to go back to, uh, because of the slide, the way it was coming up, but uh, this is not about just building partnerships. As I've indicated, it's about being uh, building relationships because I see uh, as far as the emergency management agency here in the city of Taunton is concerned, we take in the tier two reports as well as the Taunton Fire Department. The Taunton Fire Department is the uh, uh, community right to know officer. That's where that individual resides and they too take in the tier two information. But we have a, a unique opportunity to build those partnerships. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they have their other duties to do uh, as well, but we've tried to build relationships with those organizations in our community. It helps us to uh, prepare. And by having the relationships, when something does take place, we're able to, uh, and I'll show you in a second, we're able to, by having uh, solid relationships, we have the, we try very, very hard to collect people's cell phone numbers, 
contact information. That could be in a tier two information, but for the most part, we don't want to be, as the old rule in emergency management goes, we don't want to be handing out a business card during the time of emergency. You want to be right on top of that. So what we try to do is we try to employ uh, different communication modes. Now, I'm going to show you what's coming up on your screen with uh, Twitter, Facebook, and another application that we use, another app uh, It's called Nextdoor. But here's how we use those tools. It's not to just say how great the uh, Taunton Emergency Management is or what the city is doing to prepare, but we encourage uh, our partners to subscribe and have these tools uh, to our sites or uh, to our pages so that we can communicate with them directly, send out informa emergency information, things that are actually happening real time in the community. And basically we do that 24 hours a day, although we can't, we have to sleep sometimes. So, but there have been so many examples and I'll just name one where we had a major company in our industrial park and we had a, a, a rollover with a tractor trailer truck it, it closed the whole roadways. People had to, people had to uh, take other routes, and we were able to send that notification out to them. We also do it through email, and they had a direct link between themselves and the community. They didn't have to guess at it because that's where the whole social media piece comes into play as well. You have all these folks that are uh, consistently monitoring police scanners and fire scanners, and they're getting out information that might or might not be true. By having that relationship with that company, I can pick up the phone and get and get an idea of what's going on. Of course, our first responders are there, but sometimes for the emergency management community, the city government, which is really uh, with a liaison between the um, emergency agencies and the city government, it's it's really incredibly important that we know what's going on and then they know what's going on from the city's response. So we use the tools, not necessarily just to, to uh, sing our own praises, but also to communicate. This has been a very important tool, but we use it all the time. We all have it and that's email. And what we try to do is to keep those relationships alive is that we on a regular basis send out uh, parking bans when there's some major snowstorms. We send out weather alerts. Uh, we work very closely and have a partnership with the National Weather Service. Uh, they were here in Taunton and they've moved to the town of Norton, which is right next door. But we have that partnership with them and we consistently get that information and we send that out. We do this with the schools. We do this with companies. We do this with the president of the hospital, um, their emergency preparedness uh, community, their emergency management people and preparedness people. And just for an example with the hospital, now they're a tier two reporter, but having that relationship with them on a on a 24 hour, uh, uh, 24 hour basis, if we needed to with their cell phone, that becomes critically important. With that explosion in the industrial park, we can easily notify them and say, you know, it's not the big deal that people are making it out to be. We do have some folks that are en route to your facility. Of course, the ambulance is communicating as well, but there's a, there's a direct relationship. And this is what we try to do. We're not, not only on partnerships, but, but relationships. And relationships is the person to person. I want to know who I'm calling. I want them to know whom, whom they're calling as well. So, um, and once again, uh, just the, the social media outlets that we use, not just a tool to promote your organization, but a tool to communicate with your community and your community government and emergency responder uh, groups. There's also for anyone uh, that's part of this um, uh, webinar today that's part of Southeast in Massachusetts, there's a, an application called Code Red. It's provided by the Plymouth, it's hosted by the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department and all the communities have access to that system to send out these notifications. If you are part of one of those communities, you can certainly log on to this and register your phone number because most people these days, at least according to the statistics, are showing that more people have cell phones than actual house phones. So uh, it's important, they, the code red system would not have your cell phone, you have to call and register. So become part of that. You know. For the city of Taunton, and once again, I can only speak for the city of Taunton, although I do serve on the Southeast Homeland Security Council, I, I, I come in contact with a lot of my counterparts uh, in area communities and, and across the state of Massachusetts, for that matter. And, you know, we all do things in a different way, but 
I, I will continue because I see the, the critically uh, important aspect that relationships are when there's an emergency. We sometimes don't think about it, but um, it, 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 it takes a lot of extra effort, but building those relationships with your first responders is critically important. And here's one thing I really wanna say, and I think this message has been uh, hammered home to uh, both Tiffany and me during our presentations. So we, we did a presentation in Taunton. We did a presentation at the Cape Cod uh, Cooperative Extension back in December. And here's one of the comments that folks make. If you're a consultant, if you're an industry leader, and you're reaching out to your local public safety folks and they're non-responsive or they're sort of cold, uh, you know, re responding to you coldly, I, I would say persist or reach out to the fire chief or to someone in management because sometimes as a, as a municipal employee, and one who really cares about being building relationships and partnerships with people. I hear that, you know, we reached out to them and they really didn't care. They didn't really want to talk to us. We heard this from a consultant in Attleboro. And a lot of the tier two information that comes, um, a lot of the tier two information that comes to us uh, is from consultants. It might be from folks within the, uh, the particular company, but a lot of consultants are hired by organizations and I think they kind of feel they get the cold shoulder, but uh, I would hate to think that that's the case. It's certainly not the case here in the city of Taunton and I would certainly pursue that with, uh, with management. I'm just gonna run through a couple of uh, just photographs that we have from emergencies that have taken place here in the city and they've probably happened in your community as well but these are all things that in you know impact the uh, the daily lives of people that are working at your companies or how they interact so we've had you know major uh, major fires shuts down roadways we look at transportation uh, our agency for the most part focuses on uh, we respond to every fire that uh, happens in the city we coordinate with the red cross we we coordinate all those resources that, um, that you know tend to assist people now down the bottom right hand corner there right above the seal you see are working with the Red Cross. Well, you know, there could be a chemical spill and folks have to be evacuated to a nearby hotel. Uh, the resources that needed to uh, to be brought in, we, we would work with that. We would work with a company to actually provide those resources. Once again, we're not the police and fire agencies. We're not locking up criminals or fighting fires, but we are handling the people side and certainly chemicals and their interaction and, uh, you know, in a community and the impact that those companies or those events would have on a community of pretty significant. This is just uh, back in 2010 and uh, it had not occurred even close to this uh, since 1967 where our Route 44 both east and west was completely shut down. Just over that bridge is the Taunton River and that hit a record level of 15 feet and shut down the entire city for nearly a, 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 a two-week period. And the interesting thing is when the water receded, what was left? chemicals on the roadway, oil, gas, residents were pretty anxious about getting back into the, uh, onto the roadway. State would not allow us to reopen it until the chemicals were put down to take care of that sewerage, gas. You, you, you just don't know what the impact is gonna be, but there happened to be a gas station that was right in the middle of that whole thing. And that certainly had an impact. That might be on a small scale, but it certainly could happen on a large scale. This photograph that you're seeing here, it actually goes back to uh, 1918. This is the uh, the uh, Reed and Botten, famous uh, Reed and Botten silverware. And you see all those people looking at a major flood that took place. Well, that flood not only took place in 1918, it took place in 1967 and it hit, hit again in 2005. I'm fortunate, uh, it's, we're fortunate today that all those dams have been removed. There were five of them along the, the Mill River and they've all been removed at this particular uh, time. But just like in 1918, the same happened in 2005. If you look over to the left-hand side, you can see the building, but those buildings were lo uh, loaded with chemicals. And that would, that those chemicals, had they been, had they come in contact with the water could certainly have been carried across the city into the downtown area and then out to the Taunton River in the, uh, the west section of our city. So chemicals, and we, we might be looking, everybody might be looking at that dam crisis and the major flooding, but what was really happening there at this particular location was that serious condition that was developing if that those chemicals and water were to come in contact. And that certainly was the case in 2005 when we had the major dam crisis, which was a, nat a really an internationally covered uh, event.
So this is just some of the other resources. Taunton is also is a uh, reception center for the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant. I know most of the, uh, you folks will be seeing in the news that it's closing at the end of May, and that is true, but all the resources and all the training for our volunteers should an event occur, uh, we have here in the city of Taunton. We've been part of this program for 27 years, and we, we work with volunteers. But if that were an event that uh, took place at a company, a lot of these resources with Tyvek suits and rubber booties and having the ability to actually monitor. And as you'll see here, uh, these are many of our volunteers being trained and further the Tyvek, the uh, rubber uh, floor matting and the portal monitors that are used for radiation detection uh, are right here in the city. And like I said, we train volunteers as well. And we work very closely with FEMA and MEMA, uh, the uh, state of Massachusetts emergency management to address these issues. So, uh, so chemicals, radiation, uh, flooding, major events all, all come into play. And it's critically important that we as emergency preparedness uh, folks, first responders, uh, community leaders are involved and have personal and develop personal relationships with companies or anyone who uh, has something that is going to impact the community in, a, in a, uh, an emergency event. And I think that is pretty much just once uh, one of the shower areas that we have as part of the uh, nuclear power plant. But once again, a lot of these things are in place. Um, once again, reach out to your communities, never take no for an answer. Um, it, it, it would really, every time I hear it, when someone stands up in the audience and says, you know, I reached out to my community and they were really, they gave me the cold shoulder. Uh, it becomes very disappointing to me. So I would encourage the relationships, you know, the social media, uh, emails, be get a part, be become a part of that group in your community, so you'll have that that communication that goes on all the time, and not just when there's an emergency. And with that, uh, just a few minutes earlier, but I will uh, end my presentation. Great, great, thank you, Rick. Um, so again, this is Tiffany Skogstrom from OTA, and if you have questions for either myself or Rick, um, please type them in the chat box. Um, and I also want to thank everyone for um, our growing pains as we figure out how to mute and unmute each other. <laughs> so, so thank you for that. So um, if anyone has any questions, please enter them now into the, the chat box and we will answer them as they come up. Okay, in the meantime, um, I, I don't see anything yet. Oh, okay. So someone says, um, can they get a copy of the Tura questions? Yes, we can send out um, the Tura quiz questions. Um, definitely, um, we, we will do that. Uh, and the Tura quiz is specifically for people seeking one credit um, as toxic use reduction planners as they're licensed in uh, under DEP. So not everyone has to have the quiz. Some people some people want the credits. If you're not a TERP planner, um, it doesn't necessarily apply to you. Um, but I will ask Rick a question myself, which is, um, can you talk a little bit about the drill that you did on the ammonia leak? Because I think that that is something that unfortunately we've seen ammonia leaks uh, in the city of Boston. And it's something that we do have a lot of ammonia users all over the state. Um, and so I think that what, what you did with your ammonia leak drill is a good example of, um, you know, community uh, partnership with, with a private company. Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Tiffany. As you know, that uh, that particular s uh, scenario uh, was played out because the individuals responsible for it were part of the uh, Southeastern Regional Planning uh, and Economic Development presentation that we did back in, I think, I believe it was March of 2018. It was on a very stormy day, as a matter of fact. And uh, that individual was there, or those individuals were there. And once again, we had a chance to follow up with them and build that partnership, uh, review their two, tier two information, and certainly based on uh, you know the uh, the information that you provided in encouraging exercises. Uh, that can, we made that happen. It, it took a, a little while to put it all together, but they did an evacuation, 
and we were able to photograph that and we had a chance to go through the facility and see where the people would go. Once again, uh, we did this along with the fire department as well, uh, Taunton Fire participated and, the, um, and obviously the emergency management agency, but we had a chance to look at where their wind socks were located, uh, you know, so that they could uh, judge wind direction. We had a chance to see where the individuals would uh, be evacuated to the areas that they had set up. So that gave us a great working knowledge of you know what we would do how we would assist as a community should anything ever happen but once again it comes to uh, a desire but it come it uh, comes out of a desire uh, for a company to be part of the community a willingness to to exercise with them but if that's the case, you know, it works on it worked in both, uh, you know, on both sides, and uh, you know, to this day, it be, it's become a great, uh, great relationship and a great partnership. Great, great, yeah. No, we're really happy to to see that happening, um, and and OTA definitely, um, you know, has worked by side side by side with emergency uh, folks. Uh, and and companies to also initiate conversations with, between people who are actually reluctant to approach their fire department. They have come to OTA and said, "Hey, you know, can you help us? You know, can you come to the table and and sort of like convene these types of conversations?" So that that is great. Um, you know, so we try to help people uh, make that type of connection. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple other questions. Um, uh, just came up. This one's for you, Rick. Uh, was the Cameo system used for dispersion modeling in the ammonia drill? Yeah, well, uh, no, I, I can honestly say that it was not for that ammonia drill, but that a Cameo is something that we use. And uh, it's kind of interesting with the tier two information. We ask everyone who files with a tier two report that they give it to us electronically on a CD, a thumb drive, so that we can take that information and put it into Cameo. Uh, mm -hmm. We weren't able to do the modeling. That's a, that's a great suggestion, though, and one of those things that you learn, the technology is, is changing all the time, and their versions of Cameo have changed. Uh, we did not use that particular, though, uh, to answer your question specifically for that exercise, but that's a great suggestion. Great. Um, so the next question is, where do we access the vulnerability map? And that's actually available on OTA's website, which was um, in the presentation, but it's mass.gov forward slash EEA forward slash OTA dash climate. Um, and how often is it updated? We use all of the, um, it's, it's basically from all of the mass GIS maps. So as soon as those are updated, um, they are up, it should be the most local of all of our mass GIS data. But in addition, um, the second, the question before that asked about dispersion. Um, so we, we have um, a, a BU student who just did uh, chemical dispersion uh, forecasting in the event of flooding that we hope to maybe make available um, to our map um, with other data layers. So that means that like if you're a facility or uh, a contaminated site using chemicals, there's topographical data that could show um, where those chemicals might be dispersed in the event of a flood. So we're hoping to have those maps available if we get the student or other students this summer. Um, so it's available on our website. It's updated every time the GIS um, data itself is updated. Um, the next question is, is there a central place to submit information about unusual storm related incidents observed at facilities to potentially be used to inform future planning? Hmm. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, Rick? Well, I would just say, um, in, like I said, every every presentation we've done, you always take away great ideas, and this is another one. I can only encourage folks, if they were living in the Taunton area, to send us uh, send it to us directly uh, at the Taunton Emergency Management Agency. And I think my email address is uh, going to be made available, right, uh, Tiffany? But you can certainly send it to my attention, and I would follow up with that. Once again, I can only represent my, my community, but I encourage anyone who has a, you know, a thought or a concern, by all means, send it to us. That's the only way we can, unless we find it ourselves. Uh, uh, and like I said, we, we are pretty active here in the city. Uh, send it to us so we can take a look and, and actually review it. Yeah, and I also think that the, um, I had shown a slide on Resilient Nashua. Um, so they actually have, um, you know, in, in Nashua, New Hampshire, people who can identify areas they're concerned with and, and get 
the state's attention or the city's attention. So I think that there are ways, um, you know, like to, to get local folks attention on that type of thing. And I think that there are like, that is a very creative way that Nashua has done it. And, um, you know, people can also notify OTA, but you know, the storm related incidents are now just, people are just now starting to pay attention to them um, because, you know, climate change is happening and severe we weather incidents are happening uh, more and more frequently and more severe. Um, so the next question asks, how do you identify facilities that may not file EPCRA reports because they don't know the program exists or don't think it applies to them and bring them into these discussions? So um, we at the Office of Technical Assistance do outreach based upon, um, you know, what type of facilities exist in Massachusetts, but we are not enforcement. So actually underneath the Toxic Use Reduction Act, everything that we see um, or go over with a facility is absolutely confidential. Um, so that means that we don't report people to DEP or EPA or OSHA. Um, however, you know, most people who we have contact with uh, want to come into compliance. Um, and so, um, you know, we do do our own outreach based upon like identifying new facilities um, and, and try to make them aware of what they need to report under um, and, and bring them into discussion. And most people do want to do that because they want to be able to keep running um, the, the, I don't know what is. Um, they, they do want to keep running and be in compliance. Um, but I also wanna, you know, say that OTA is not enforcement. Um, so we help, we help everyone and anyone. Um, Tiffany, I just going to just mention that, uh, you know, once again, um, I've also been a student of one of your, your presentations uh, a number of, of times. And I would say to any one part of this webinar today, you know, to certainly reach out to your office uh, because you can be a benefit. And if there's a, sometimes, uh, you know, companies are a little reluctant if they have issues and they might not, they might think that uh, Tiffany is going to uh, try to enforce something. But I think if you make uh, folks uh, comfortable, you want, you, we want to work with them. The city, uh, the, the, in, in uh, OTA certainly wants to work with these companies. It's important to all of us. And uh, so certainly reach out and, you know, make them feel comfortable to do that. She has some outstanding uh, information and assistance to offer. Yeah, and I will also add that, um, you know, our thank, and thank you for that, Rick, by the way, it was very kind. Um, we, since we did these trainings that were under the grant, we've been going around to local and regional emergency planning committees, like all over the state. Uh, and one of the things that we can offer is um, identifying facilities and helping them, uh, you know, inviting them to attend and participate in local and regional planning, uh, emergency planning committees. Um, so, and also if you are, um, you know, part of the municipal vulnerability preparedness program, uh, if you've received a grant from them, OTA can, for absolutely free and separate from that grant, try to bring tier two facilities and, um, you know, chemical users to the table to get them to participate in your emergency planning. So that's something that we will do um, regardless of whether you're uh, a grant recipient from that. And also we encourage you to look at the Toxic Use Reduction Institute grants and consider um, OTA as part of that um, because in a, you know, regardless of whether or not you get a grant, we do that for free. Um, so with that, um, Maya actually says that, um, you know, and this popped up in your chat that an email should, it will be sent out with the recording link and the slides and other resources within the next few days. Um, with that, I'd like to wrap it up. It's uh, five minutes to 11. And I wanna thank everyone for bearing with our, um, our growing pains. And especially I wanna thank uh, Rick Ferreira for being a great partner. Um, and also for <laughs> for coping mm -hmm. with us as we as we sort of grew through this process, um, you know, we would love to take suggestions for other topics. Um, and you know, in in the future, you know, we we hope to have less glitches uh, with more experience. But if you have topics that you think that we should cover, uh, please email them to us. And also, um, you know, think of us as as a resource. Uh, and please spread the word and apply for those grants. And, and thanks again uh, to Rick and Maya for, for all of this today. So thank Absolutely. you very much. Thank you.
Okay. Have a good day, everyone.